I've been playing visual novels for quite a few years now, starting in 2016 with the Mirror Moon translations of Tsukihime and Fate Stay Night, and continuing on in high gear over the last year, both for this channel and for my own personal interest. I've seen a lot of things from cute mundane slice of life, to fascinating and forgotten Lovecraftian horror, to absolute letdowns. And in all of this, I've found myself constantly wanting to find weirder and weirder things. Not really for shock value, but because sometimes the most esoteric and bizarre media can be the most impactful and fascinating in ways that traditional stories aren't able to be. And that search can be a massive challenge, especially as many of these games can be forgotten, hard to find, hard to get running. There can be any number of barriers in the way of me and my bullshit. However, sometimes I get recommended or stumble into a title that truly deserves the banner of weird. No hyperbole, no clickbait, just absolute unhinged absurdity that feels like nothing else ever made, that few people talk about and even fewer have played. Weird, off-kilter, and unique tales that one has to dig to find and dig harder to read. Something that can be equitably described as one of the most bizarre games ever made. And by god does today's title deliver. Jisatsu no Tame no Hyakuichi no Hoho, a title literally translating to one 101 Ways to Kill Yourself is one of the free classic Dempa subgenre games alongside Sayonara Oshiete and Suri no Soda, the latter of which would be reworked into Subihibi over a decade later. TNS is also the only game of those free made by a company that managed to survive after releasing a Dempa game, a fate not so unfitting for a genre of a focus on the collapse of sanity and being. Much like Sayo Oshi was the last title Kraftwerk would release before the staff dispersed to work on various other games, Jisatsu was the one and only Duke could manage to put out. But most of the developers here weren't as lucky. Only four of the 16 staff members who worked on the game kept working in the Edo Gay or anime industry, two of which only worked on a single unremarkable title after, one of which was the OP and ED vocalist, and the last of which was the lead writer, Ryunosuke Kingetsu, credited here under the pen name Yamada Orochi. Fans of mid-2000s anime and Yuta Fotobo's works may recognize the name, as he was the lead writer for Manabi Straight and Hudakoi Alternative, the former slice of life that some swear by being one of the best ever made, and the latter a very, very different take on Hudakoi, as well as a slew of other shows and OVAs that I've personally never heard of. Suffice to say though, the man has some clout and an interesting legacy, and Jisatsu is by far the most curious part of it to me. This game is a bizarre combination of many different things. On one hand, it's very clearly inspired by other bishoujo games of the time, such as Key's Canon and Leaf's Two Heart, with a number of cute girls who all have trouble hiding below their surfaces. And on the other, it deals with sci-fi concepts and complex themes of trauma in a way not unlike Lane and Evangelion, the latter of which was an explicit influence on the story. If thematically dense works of heavy cultural commentary and simpler high school love stories with a touch of sci-fi seem like disparate companions, well, welcome to the weird, confusing, and utterly unhinged world of Jisatsu 101, a work caked in ambiguity and insanity as much as it is grounded realities and visual novel tropes of the era. I'm gonna be blunt, this game is a mess. It is the most wild shit I've ever read, and I adore it as much as I am utterly bewildered a title like this got to market. A work about philosophy, teenage angst, brutal violence, honest depictions of mental health, the pain of trauma, our relationship to life and death, and societal isolation coated in a veneer of sci-fi tropes and confusing twists and turns. And it looks like this. It's a game with many things to say, and when it says them well, it genuinely hits. There were many points here that I felt legitimately moved or unnerved, many things that caught me off guard that I think will stay with me for a long time, yet there were also many things that left me confused as to what exactly the game was trying to say or how what I was reading tied into any larger themes or the story as a whole. All of this is coupled with a healthy dose of line blurring between what's real and what's a delusion, fitting for a title retroactively labeled as Dempa, and some of the most scrunkly art I have ever seen when there even is art, a soundtrack that plays at the most inappropriate times, and an engine so jank that I had to fight to get this game even running on my laptop. But I did it, and I read the entire thing, and now I'm going to bless or curse depending on your perspective everyone watching this who has not read the game yet with the forbidden knowledge of the scrunkliest game about life and death, reality and fiction, trauma and agency, and just how it's managed to garner enough of a cult following to sell for upwards of 200,000 yen. Jisatsu takes place in then contemporary Japan and primarily follows our male protagonist, the young Torabishi Takuji, a man unremarkable in most all ways except for one, a mysterious ailment that causes him to hear a noise he can only define as grey. Tortured by it long before the story begins, his ability to separate reality from fantasy has worsened alongside it, causing him to now be torn between two worlds, the world of delusions encompassing bizarre fantasies and violent ideas, and the real world, where he attempts to cope with his darkest thoughts and live alongside his friends and classmates. Among 
Among them are the loving younger stepsister Samamo, a girl who appears doting on the surface but carries great burdens and sadness with her, the tomboyish Momiji, whom Takuji feels unrequited love for, the quiet and edgy Kana, who struggles with her past and keeps her darkest secrets locked away from all but Takuji, the skull pride Natane, a brilliant academic who believes deeply in conspiracy theories, and the mysterious Mido, a violent man who sits at the top of the skull's social ladder. All of them start their day as normal, but before long find themselves in the midst of a bizarre and unexplainable conflict involving mass suicide, an unstoppable bioweapon threatening the fate of humanity and forces far beyond their control. A conflict that tears each of them apart as they're forced to face their darkest sides and truths. Trauma, violent urges, societal casts, all while Takuji is caught in the middle and finds himself in a web of complicated and conflicting realities that may very well decide the fate of humanity. Shisatsu kind of defies a normal introduction. I'd go as far as to say it actively tries to defy normal plot summaries. I did as best as I could to give a framework to work off of, parsing from what I got when reading and from the official plot description, but this is a case where a premise doesn't give you any idea of what the actual experience will be like. That's something only the opening can do. The world, the world, the world. Just about everything is the world, but what is it? What can define the world? Define can what the world? The world can define what? Define can the world what? The world define what can? A uh, henceforth dawn welt id? And it just goes from there, until we get another scene of a bunch of students watching someone attempt to end their life, followed by musings on Takuji's mysterious illness and growing inability to separate reality from delusion, until it's finally broken up by him being woken up by a supposed delusion of his stepsister, wearing lingerie and talking something about stairs. You can opt into seeing what might be having Kami snuggles with her, or opt not to and proceed the day as normal as possible. This includes eating breakfast while contemplating death, getting upset with pompous television hosts talking about a teen suicide epidemic and how it might just be an attention-seeking fad, and then after more amusing with dark and brooding music and stepbrother, stepsister fantasizing, you're treated to this. This is the most sane part of the game. Jisatsu is a story of bizarre shifts in mood, long rambles about contentious topics, and confusion between reality and fantasy, among other things, containing one of the most unique atmospheres of any story I think I've ever experienced, be it visual novel, anime, manga, film, other video game, or really otherwise. It's as much a normal linear novel as it is a beat-by-beat -beat flood of philosophical digressions, moments of pure madness, and character actions that all only sometimes have an effect on story progression. While that sounds like it should be a recipe for disaster, Jisatsu finds a way to make it work, thanks primarily due to its very unique prose. Rather than following a singular character's thoughts and narration, Jisatsu is told far more like a traditional novel. Kinda. The story is primarily seen from a third-person perspective, one that's simultaneously reliable, yet also as confused about what's happening as the reader, posing as many questions as it does factual statements and flowing between the kind of objectivity you'd expect from such narration and utter goddamn absurdity. Can a man who has never eaten beefsteak truly describe the flavor of beefsteak? I won't profess that I'm some expert of genres that's read absolutely everything and knows every style. I am but a wee babby in terms of Japanese study and a homeschooled 21 year old that's been binging written media for the last year after scarcely consuming it for a period, but I have seen quite a few different styles of writing in that time, and if I had to make some sort of comparison... Imagine if Murakami Haruki or a not racist HP Lovecraft did acid, crashed their car, and had a near-death experience where they saw Jesus handing them a copy of Canon and all of Evangelion on Laserdisc, and then decided to make a novel based on that. That's Jisatsu. It's very flashy and verbose, laden in metaphor and elongated explanations to dive into topics and themes the story is concerned with, but it also has some of the most incredible tonal whiplash one might expect from that allegory. Though unlike Lovecraft's impressive, long-winded descriptions that use words no one else has in the last 80 years, Jisatsu is much simpler to get. The literal text is on about the same level of challenge as a slice of life game, and while there are some parts here and there that get difficult, and some that are clearly intended to be a challenge to read, the game generally holds itself back from reading like Finnegan's Wake. Part of what helps is that the story is primarily set in a typical Japanese school setting. Even if this game does explore the darker sides of that in a blunt way, it shouldn't be at all unfamiliar to you if you've read a story set in that, and the game does a good job explaining the weirder things with the aliens and the 5D crazy waves while everything falls apart around our main characters and the plot becomes more complicated. Contrary to how it may seem from the outset, Jisatsu is actually kind of a stealth sci-fi story, tackling concepts such as parallel worlds, alien life, absurd bioweapons, and more. It's not hardcore sci-fi like, say, 
way Baldur Sky is, but it's far from the void of it with the many worlds interpretation of parallel worlds in particular being a major part of Takaji's character. As the intro establishes very effectively, his perspective is unreliable and coded in a mixture of cynicism, nihilism, and depression, trying to find his footing while being torn between his delusions and realities. Not following him in the first person does grant us a greater level of objectivity about events, but that doesn't mean you can trust everything characters say or everything that happens. To say the least, Takuji is a very broken man who just somehow manages to hold together enough to live the facsimile of a normal life. The difference here is that while other stories might portray that facsimile as idyllic with some drama here and there, Jisatsu is very upfront that a normal life for anybody different from the norm means struggling to make it from morning to night. As a game that deals heavily with mental health, this perspective lends a pretty honest and uncomfortable air to the whole experience that does genuinely embody the ways in which it can feel like reality is breaking down around you, or maybe that you're breaking down because of reality, with the story attempting a fine balancing act between the different worlds that Takuji feels he's stuck in. I have some big gripes of how this game tells its story, but one thing that I can't fault it for is how well it manages to use prose, narration, and structure against the reader to muddy the waters between reality and delusion, and portrays Takuji's struggles both in his own mind and fitting into a world hostile to him and others, without truly losing the plot too bad. All of this, the simple to parse yet dense writing, the idyllic setting whose reality collapses, the bizarre method of storytelling, and the characters, creates that aforementioned unique atmosphere. It's more impersonal than a first-person account, yet more in involved in many traditionally narrated novels, bridging the gap in a way that flows between keeping you at a safe distance from the absurdities to just throwing you head first and leaving you on your own to solve what's going on. If it's any sort of solace, you don't exactly have to piece things together over multiple routes. Jisatsu is loaded with choices, but it's mostly a linear experience with some short alternate scenes based on what you pick, and a slightly different ending depending on if you have more points of Samamo, Momiji, or Kana. Of those three, I really feel like Samamo is the route you're intended to go on, as Momiji's unique scenes are all boring and add nothing, and Kana's route just straight up has a different ending CG with no new content. If you're gonna play this game, then I really recommend following a guide and sticking exclusively to Samamo's path, as the others are just a waste of time. Honestly, this whole game feels like it was thrown together and stitched together at the last minute, which makes sense given that it, uh, was. According to Orochi, the game didn't have a ton of planning. He was brought in by Duke and told to make something that wasn't too hard, and so wrote a bunch of scenes and strung them together in a way that created a story functional enough to track. As an end result of this, we've ended up with a plot just incoherent enough to make the player question whether or not what they're experiencing is intended to be confusing. I didn't really find myself struggling to understand the writings at my current reading level as much as I did trying to parse just how the hell everything connected. What does not help with this is the odd pacing of Jisatsu's story. While there is a clear through line here to some extent, much of what happens doesn't serve to move the main plot along, but instead to introduce or expound on characters. You could seriously cut a massive chunk of scenes out in this game and not affect how things progress whatsoever, as most of what occurs isn't because of character actions, at least not until the beginning of the second arc, but rather the world progresses without any of their input. And they have a lot of input. Everybody here is in some kind of way fucked up, and some are just as bad, if not worse, than Takuji. Some of them are power-hungry murderers, some of them are trauma-ridden conspiracy theorists, and for everyone else, there's enough existential dread to go around. There is a very bizarre dichotomy here, however, in that there's two types of Jisatsu 101 characters. One is the most interesting shit you'll ever read. I've already talked about how fascinating Takuji is, and I think Samamo, Kana, and Natane managed to hit those high highs as well. They get by far the most character development and have the most interesting themes. Games, tackling trauma and abuse in surprisingly mindful and clever ways that make good use of the game's bizarre storytelling structure. By the end of my time reading, I was thoroughly invested in each of them, and as evidenced later in this video, I had a lot to say about them. The other kind, however, are characters who fall just short of being engaging. Mido's role as school bully and effectively top of the food chain does come up in some interesting ways, as the intention of the character seems to be exploring what would happen if Takuji let his violent fantasies take hold of him, but as I'll talk about in the spoiler section, he just felt needlessly edgy by the end. Akaneko feels like she's going for a similar thing with regards to her position as a teacher and school hierarchies, but none of it ever panned out for me, though maybe that's just because I was never in school myself so I just can't click with any of it. And Momiji? She just barely exists for the story and has basically no meaning as a character far as I can discern. This contrast is a very major problem and it would frankly ruin the game if it weren't for those strong characters and the writing being as engrossing as it is. Beyond the prose, there's a dialogue which can be anything from mundane to utterly batshit with some legitimately good chemistry between Takuji and the rest of the cast, and a lot of god-tier quotes out of context. 
But for all of the genuinely great content focusing on individual characters and their interactions with each other, the actual main story suffers greatly from that stitched together production. The game, seemingly by accident, constantly muddies whether or not many of the Dempa elements are meant to be as confusing as they are. Personally, I think the truth lays somewhere in the middle. A lot of the concepts and ideas that Jisatsu brings up are all normal sci-fi tropes, and I don't think are really intended to make the player question the legitimacy of what they're reading like it would be in a game actually developed as a Dempa title. That said, it does seem to purposefully leave some things vague for players to interpret however they want. I don't think you're intended to theorycraft the sci-fi elements away, but I do think the game wants you to cast doubt on Takuji's grasp on reality. On the other hand, I think this idea that games with a Dempa label are intended to be mind-bogglingly complex has led to some people interpreting the game as way more complicated than the literal text actually is, especially since this is a game that was retroactively given that label. As Orochi said in an interview, I never felt like I was a part of the visual novel industry. While I did create something, I never went back to this world. Well, I didn't even expect it to sell at all, and I didn't really get involved in any way. No involvement, really, and I never regarded myself as being part of the free Dempa games everyone's muttering about. Given Orochi's inclination towards writing more straightforward works after this, I don't think there was ever any intention for this to be more complex than weird fiction like a Lovecraft tale. It just happened that way because the production of Jisatsu was a bizarre mess, as evidenced by the art. This game is... scrunkly. The lead illustrator credit is a man by the name of Takamori Yu, who is an absolute goddamn enigma. Before Jisatsu, his only work that I was able to find was on a handful of comics with publishers Report and Papipo, and some doujinshi with the Circle Tomato Atelier. One of these works, Boku no Himitsu Kimi no Namida, was actually ripped online, which is how I'm able to show more off of his work than just some front covers and such. His art honestly reminds me a lot of 60s shoujo and has a very appealing aesthetic to it. The coloring and shading can be genuinely striking and interesting, and the backgrounds on the covers go so damn hard. The anatomy as well, while not perfect, generally looks like to me it's off for the sake of cutesiness, and it definitely achieves that. It actually reminds me a lot of the old Dragon Half series, which I always think nobody but me remembers until I see some piece of mink art up on my feed, so maybe I'll get more than one person watching this to see the comparison. Uh, either way, my intention is to say these both look hella fucking scrunkly, and I mean that in the sweetest way possible. I absolutely adore this look. So, just how did he get hired for this game? Game. I have no clue, and neither does anybody else seem to. The closest anyone ever got to solving the mystery was in a 2014 blog post by Koei New Computer Scans, which, incidentally, is the same place that linked the Boku Nami download. To quote, The most logical place to start for information would be the people he worked with at Duke. The result? Yet Eleven, the Jisatsu composer, never met the guy, and King Getsu, also known as Arochi, didn't have a close relationship with him. We just don't know. I figure the reality is either somebody at Duke or the company that owned them, Dozin, had a connection to them, or a staff member just saw their Dozin work and liked it. If it's the latter, then I can understand why he was picked over others given my early enthusiasm for his style, but uh, that makes me all the more confused about just what happened here, particularly with regards to coloring. The watercolor-esque look of his paper works is completely gone, and instead, the whole game looks like it was filled with a pink bucket tool and shaded with some bad brushes before having Vaseline applied to smooth out all the lines. Given that I can't find any examples of Yu having done digital artwork up to this point, I'm guessing he probably did a line art and rough sketching and other members of the graphics team handled converting his artwork from traditional to digital. That's also to say nothing of the anatomy, which, dear god. Oh dear god. Were these unfinished sketches they just colored and put in the game anyways? Were they meant to be like this? All of this creates some hardcore contrast with the writing. There's multiple scenes that with proper illustration would have probably given me nightmares, but here I had to take a break to laugh before I could actually properly process what was happening. Something that I do need to give credit for is the characters themselves. Even if this art doesn't really do them justice, there's something wonderfully simple about their designs that comes through in good fan art. Shoutouts to Len at Lakunova on Twitter for letting me use one of their pieces of art for this video's thumbnail. I absolutely adore this as well as their other illustrations. Making all of this worse, or better depending on your perspective, is that Jisatsu is one of the rare visual novels that CGs only. No backgrounds, no character sprites, and because there's only a handful of CGs, you'll be spending most of the game staring at a black screen with text. Sometimes this works to great effect, like when the story deals with traumatic flashbacks that contain content that would be hard to betray tastefully. Other times a character will tell Takuji to look at something and you'll have to read the most unhinged fucking description with absolutely no visual aid. I don't think it's ever impossible to tell what's happening or follow a situation, but it's definitely harder than in any other VN I've read up to this point and severely hampers the enjoyability of the game. The user experience does not help with this whatsoever. Before I even really got to reading the game, I had to grapple with the fact that my copy wouldn't let me access the in-game menu to save, so a friend had to send me their copy of it, which miraculously did work. 
And then as soon as I got into playing the game proper, I realized that it fucked with my mouse input. Anytime I was tabbed into the game, it just got ridiculously jittery. There's also no backlog, so playing this with a text hooker is an absolute must, even if you aren't going to be using a dictionary to aid in reading, just so you have some way of going back to old text. It's also very stingy with save slots in the original unpatched game, with a whole whopping five, though they seem to realize this was unplayable and the 1.01 patch bumped it up to 50, but that still feels insufficient given the number of choices in the game and bugs of music playback. For whatever reason, the music just stops working after it loops one time, requiring a save and load to get it back on track, which led to me eating through all of my save slots by the end of it. This might just be a Windows bug, but I patched the game with a program to make it use MP3 audio instead of CD music before playing. That's worked with every single old game I've ever played except this one. Is it a bug with the program? Is it a bug with Windows with Jisatsu? Oh god, now I'm questioning reality. Then again, that glitchiness might be a good thing as the music works against the atmosphere half the time. Excluding the opening and ending themes, which only ever play once each, there's a total of nine songs to fill out the duration of the game. Regardless of whether you are a quick reader and can finish the story in a seeming minimum of five hours, or you're like me and take 16 to see everything and reread scenes, you're going to be hearing these same tracks a lot, and you're going to be hearing the devs really stretching things thin with tracks that only vaguely fits what's happening. On the bright side, the music is genuinely really good. Most of it was composed by Yoshizawa Tsutomu under the alias Yet11, who retro VN aficionados might know for working with a team within tactics that would later become key on games like Moon and One, with additional tracks done by Nagayaka Kimiko under the alias Miku, who also worked with tactics, albeit after the formation of Key. The result is a score that, while not used all that well in the game, does still enhance the mood a lot when it works and is good listening outside of the title. I spent a decent chunk of my time writing the script listening to it, along with the composer's other works. Yet Eleven in particular put out an album that's all FM chiptune music for the old X1 Turbo Japanese computer, and that shit slaps. So, at this point, I think I've established well that Jisatsu is kind of a gigantic mess on a production level, which might have you wondering, just how does this all play out in the end and does it manage to make anything meaningful out of its rather grandiose and complex themes, despite the scrunkles, the tonal whiplash, and the bizarre plot structure? Surprisingly, yeah! Yeah, it does! While I believe that Jisatsu is highly flawed, if that's not already evident, I do think there's a lot interesting in here that deserves diving into, and a lot that makes it genuinely worth playing. So from here on, I'm going to be getting into spoilers, explaining the plot as best I can, my interpretation of some of the more ambiguous elements, and looking at themes and plot points the game handles that I think are interesting, as well as some of its further failings. But you know what else is interesting, but doesn't have failings? Patrons! Yeah! So apparently I'm incapable of making short videos. This was supposed to be a quick one while I worked on playing through rants and then it ballooned into, well, this now, which is, uh, the third or fourth time this has happened? I, I fucking lost track. I, I guess that's not necessarily a bad thing as I am still continuing to hack away at those games and make progress on my review of 01 and 02, just maybe not as fast as I wanted. But that's not important now. What is important is the first Q&A session. In the progress notes leading up to this video, I left comments open for people to submit questions they want to hear me answer here. And if all goes well, I'll be doing this for all future videos as it's both way easier than trying to think of things to write for an update, and a lot more fun since it lets me engage with viewers in a cool way. If you too want to chime in, as well as have your name on screen and support my work, then consider donating monthly on Patreon or one time via Kohi. If you have a question you want to ask for a future video on the ladder, make sure you leave it in your donation note. G asks, I would also be curious if you could one day share your modern accessible Switch VN recommendations if you have any other than the Dokusei remake. I'm going to tie this in with another question asked by Cal Parfit. What would you say is the most feminist Edoge game or the one that has the most feminist themes? The answer to both is that I don't really keep up with modern visual novels at the moment, so what I'm saying here comes entirely from friends recommending games to me and writing posts of their own. What I can say is that Jewelry Hearts Academy and Nukitashi 1 and 2 are both new games that very much fit the feminist criteria and are up my alley, with my friend Castell having written a great blog post on how the four more grapples with racism in academic settings. Kyle also asked two other questions. The first one is, how would you define the artistic merits of early Edoge when their primarily purpose was to arouse? The answer is I kinda just don't. If the game has no intention other than arousal and it's bad at that as most early Edoge are, then I try to view it purely from a historical perspective. What impact it had, trends it's a part of, and so on. If it's after like 1990, then it's a 50-50 if that game will do something to subvert that or have otherwise neat themes or be similarly only interesting from a historical POV. Their second question is, this is a pretty niche hobby, what forums or websites do you go on for your research? 
Edo Gamescape, Japanese Wikipedia, and the ADV Gamer blog run by an old man who saw these games as they came out. All of them are great places to start searching, and from there I pretty much just Google things and try to buy interviews, written resources, and so on. I also receive a lot of assistance from friends and colleagues in this. I always shout them out and literally just did it a moment ago, but Castell helped an immense amount with many of my videos by providing translations, sources, history pointers, and just flat out super useful info. Please, please follow them on Twitter and support them. Ify asks, fun idea, how about a video on some of the lesser known doujin fighting games from the early 2000s? Stay tuned in 2023. Gabriel Mobius asks, are there any plans to do a milestone video or something where you go over your setup and maybe some tips for others looking to get into never translated VNs? Definitely. Maybe in 23 or 24, I'd like to do something where I talk to translators and friends and give them a place to voice how they learn Japanese and tips they'd give the first time learners, as well as how to get set up and read untranslated games while still learning. They also ask, how do you deal with VNs that have wildly objectionable content, but some combination of art, story, and music, or gameplay systems that makes them otherwise enjoyable? This ties into a similar question that Rosabella Melanfa asks, which is, how exactly do you feel about Edoge that have more questionable themes for their age content? It comes down to how the game uses that. I think Rance is an example of a series that tries to actually say something about the contentious content, so for that video I want to do my best to explain why I believe it's interesting and it has artistic merit with actual decent arguments. For games that don't do anything with it, uh, you'll see how I feel shortly. CDP asked two questions. The first is, have you ever considered learning PMD MML and making music of your soundboard in A? I have actually many times. I'd really love to get into making P78 music the same way composers did at the time, but a mix of lack of time and motivation makes that kinda hard. The second is, do you have any interest in covering any very old, usually eight color titles, other than say, rants? If so, any in particular? Like I answered in Kyle's question, I don't think many of those games are very interesting outside of looking at them historically, and even then that's kind of limited to footnotes. That said, one I would actually like to do a video on is the original Lipstick ADV, one of the Dokusei writer's first titles. Breaker Railgun asked, could you name your top five visual novels that were the worst to get running on modern systems, even using virtual machines? Jisatsu, Odeon, Two Heart 1997, Necronomicon Windows, and Desire Remaster. The first four are all old and incredibly bratty about modern Windows, and the last one one is one of those weird games that requires you to either have a completely Japanese Windows install, down to time zones and other shenanigans, or fake one of something like Locale Emulator. It sucks, and the game's not even that good. And finally, Rosabella also asks, who is your favorite foreigner in FGO? The only right answer is Abby, and to find out why, please read Forbidden Advent Garden Salem. Thank you everyone for the questions, and as always, thank you for your continued support in any form, be it financial, and sharing, kind comments, likes, subs, feedback, just... Thank you all, and back to the show. Act 1 encompasses everything I mentioned before, as well as introducing us to the entire cast, continuing on from Samamo Momiji to edgy fuckboy Mido, and thereafter interacting with Kana. After potentially having kinky and nearly fatal sex with her, the narration cuts out and we get introduced to Natane, who proselytizes about the end of the world at the hands of aliens to anyone who will listen. After a brief introduction, to put it lightly, she proclaims to Takuji that an underground bioweapon planted in the Earth 46 million years ago by the name of Anguilla is going to activate soon. When that does happen, according to her, it'll send out radio waves that will lead to mass suicide, thus ending all human life. Hand activated seemingly does, kicking off Act 2. The two go to save Takuji's friends, starting out with Samamo, who's found herself in the middle of a circle of bullying, continuing with Kana, who fought off an insurmountable number of students and lost her mind. They manage to save both, and Natane starts leading them towards an impromptu shelter that should hopefully protect everybody from the suicide waves, and Takuji opts to break off to find the remaining classmates. On the way too, he seemingly succumbs to the 5G radio waves and attempts to take his own life, and ends up having a dream involving a man named Professor, who tells him he has a condition that causes him to become comatose toast unpredictably and wake up each time with a different personality. Natane shows up bound, gagged, and drugged, and the professor and Takuji talk about subjectivity before he's woken by Natane in the real world, accompanied by the people he was searching for. She explains to the group that the weapon has already activated with a batch of smaller waves, but when the final and most fatal one will go off is unknown to even her. It could be minutes, days, months, even years, and the only thing they can do to protect themselves is hide in that shelter. Thus, leading us into a decidedly different third act, where everything stalls as everyone attempts to work the logistics of surviving an apocalypse. Expectedly, people begin to mentally break, with fights regularly breaking out over how to ration water, food, and other living supplies, what to do with the sick and wounded, and convicting people of being alien spies, as the entire hierarchy collapses with Natane and Takuji's leadership being destroyed when she's caught taking food for herself. Mido fights and later gags her, usurping leadership for himself with Akaneko at his side. In the middle of all of this, Takuji regularly experiences more dreams involving what he now refers to as the World of White with the Professor, and talking nightly 
believe to different women about their past in the real world. Mido uses his newfound power to start changing roles, including implementing a collective punishment policy. Takuji tries to fight him in protest and gets laughed at and turned into a pulp, and Momiji attempts to leave. She stops after asking Natane if the final wave is hit yet, her laughing maniacally and saying she lied about everything. This event leads to Mido keeping his word, almost killing Natane and assaulting the women as punishment. First Kana and then Samamo, the latter being cut short as Natane stabs Mido in the eye of a needle and Takuji takes this chance to attack him. Akaneko interrupts and we cut to a flashback of Natane's past and how she came to be a conspiracy theorist due to dreams of being assaulted by aliens. Or more accurately, her stepfather dressed as one. With Natane now dead and abuses of power piling on and people becoming increasingly scared, Takuji, Momiji, Samomo, and Kana all discuss how to overthrow Mido. One dominant plan involving Momiji using her body to distract him until he can be killed. Expectedly, she rejects this and ends up snitching on the group, with Mido going to confront them and saying he'll have sex with her later against their promise. Mido once again beats the shit out of Takuji, this time to the point he faints and wakes up to Momiji being abused. He loses consciousness again and drifts into the world of white. In one of the prior dreams, a vision of Natane explains to him that this world is in fact the real world. Up until this point we've been seeing the past, but the truth according to her is that this place is one Takuji constructed himself following the Dempa waves killing everyone but him and the professor who wants to keep Takuji ignorant of his powers. Initially doubting that he created this world or anything in it, he is, in this final dream, able to find a slip up in the professor's speech that proves the illegitimate and artificial nature of the world, leading it to shatter with only him and Natane escaping, creating various other realities where he lives a peaceful life of Samamo, Natane or Momiji, and one more of virtual reality. He thinks Dream Natane for opening his eyes, and comes back to the school world where Mido is killed by his hands. In the good ending, him and the heroine of the player's choice leave the shelter, only to be stunned at how the school has seemingly transformed into a place of years of rotten decay. They manage to find a way to break out via the old school hospital, beating a hole into the wall until noises suddenly begin to flare up. The final wave has activated, and with it the two find themselves bloodied and battered following its assault. If it left ambiguous if they die or successfully escape. There is a lot to unpack here. What do each of the free worlds that Takaji inhabits mean? If Natsune was lying about everything, then why did everyone suddenly become filled with the lust for blood? Were the Dempa waves actually real, or is there some other explanation? Did Takaji survive at the end using his powers, or were those fake too? Were his delusions truly delusions, or was it him refusing to accept reality as it is? Like I said before, I don't know if Jisatsu was meant to be this open-ended. Since so much of it can be explained with common sci-fi concepts, I think a lot of the ambiguity comes from the script reading more like a first or second draft than an actual finished product, but what we have is what we got and what readers will make of it depends on who you talk to. One perspective comes from Davzi's blog post on the game. In some ways, this reminds me of Metal Gear Solid 2, another game in which the nature of reality in the in-game universe is often called into question. In the end, the plot breaks down, and what is left is something that only makes sense as allegory. What that actual allegory would be is something that's up to players' interpretation. This isn't the perspective I personally hold, but I can see why some would come to it given the way it's written. To me, Jisatsu's story doesn't really break down, and still tracks in a literal way if you're willing to accept everything you're shown as events that actually happened and not just delusions. Takaji is indeed trapped between free worlds, the delusions he sees are often real things that he fails to cope with, and the aliens are actually real, even if Natane's theories were mixed in heavily with her own trauma. My reasoning for this is the presence of the mysterious professor, which BDSM Natane isn't sure of the exact nature of but claims that he plays a major role in this world where everyone dies, and he definitely seems to have some sort of great power and stake in how things play out. Aliens not existing also makes the whole Dempa Waves thing make absolutely no sense. I can't imagine any other reason as for why people went maniacal other than Anguilla being a real threat. As for the free worlds, well, this is where you can really start to see the Evangelion influence, with the ending sequence taking cues from the last two episodes of the TV series. Similar to how Shinji flows between worlds given the chance to create his own, Takaji glides between different different artificial realities before eventually accepting his world, the real one, as the one he belongs in, breaking out of the shelter and escaping the school. This seems most likely to me given that one of the bad endings is Takuji denying what BDSM Natane tells him, staying in the white world and then promptly losing his shit. The way in which the narration talks about the boundaries between these worlds also reminds me a lot of Serial Experiments Lane, to the point that it would kinda shock me if Orochi had never seen it. That series too sees our main character struggling to find the boundaries between two different worlds, with them becoming more closely linked as the story progresses, with the rest of the characters suffering for it. 
Granted, Lane takes this in a very different angle from Chisatsu, whereas Lane uses that as a jumping off point to talk about the internet, communication, isolation, and a staggering amount of other things, Chisatsu's thematic intentions are way different. As the worlds blur together and Takuji is forced to make a decision, he realizes he cannot stay in one of these false realities. Not the white world, not one of the idyllic worlds, but instead he has to live in the real world of all of its flaws. Essentially, you can't run from your troubles, you have to live in the reality where you face them head on. Takuji spends much of the game running from the responsibility of his own actions and things he's witnessed, excusing many of them as delusions, and so I think resolving his character arc like this is a good idea in theory, but it's done very confusingly. I, honest to god, couldn't tell you what the intention was for a while after finishing the story. Some of it just feels very bizarrely explained, especially the sequence of Takuji creating the alternate happy worlds. I was genuinely confused what was going on for a bit and had to double check theories with friends to make sense of it all. In fact, I had to check quite a few things with friends and go over theories. This is definitely a story you'll want to book club if at all possible to see if other people might catch things you could miss when reading. I also think it's interesting to hear different takes on different parts of the game's story, particularly as it pertains to how each act plays out. I've I've seen a lot of people who are very mixed on the third act of The Shelter, but enjoyed everything leading up to it. Personally, I think The Shelter is simultaneously the best part of the game since it's far more grounded than everything leading up to it, and the worst shortly after Natane loses leadership. All of the politicking about how to best distribute resources, the paranoia as people suspect each other and fight over leadership details, and the uncertain stillness as nothing happens as tension thick enough to cut with a knife permeates the air. It's one of the places where the prose really shines, establishing how being locked up and confined is painful and isolating no matter how many other people you're with which feels weirdly topical. On the other hand, once Mido usurps leadership, he pretty much turns from a very aggressive voice of some reason that questions some of Natane's motives into the unhinged love child of Stalin and Shadow the Hedgehog. He constantly talks down to people, beats the shit out of them for questioning him even slightly, and runs everything of an iron fist. He also commits a lot of acts of sexual violence for no good reason. I said before that Mido may very well have been intended to be Takaji Unleashed, but the lengths the game goes to show that without ever really balancing him out with any other interesting traits makes it hard for me to find anything to say about him, especially because those lengths go far. Every single H scene in the third act is way, way worse than what the game normally shows you, and that's saying a lot. Jisatsu's Edo is, almost without exception, awful. I do understand what the game is going for since most of the scenes before the third act are what Takaji claims to be delusions. He beats himself up for having feelings for his stepsister, and that results in more and more violent fantasies. He loves Momiji but can't have her, and so he resorts to imagining what it would be like to take her. There is at least some underlying logic as to why these are the way they are, but with the exception to one or two scenes, I don't think the intention works out. They're grim and uncomfortable, yet the prose also seems to want to appeal to a fetish side of it, without considering how every other aspect of its presentation diminishes that appeal. Even the most vanilla of scenes feel like they're caught between wanting that same level of reality-bending expressiveness and being genuinely hot. Many of these are also really fucked up, and as I didn't get anything more out of them thematically other than Takuji is repressed and horny, it just felt like unabashed, unnecessary cruelty. And once that element is gone in the third act and replaced with Mido and Akaneko being relentlessly cruel, all value went out the window for me. I really don't think there's anything you'd be missing if you just read the lead-up to them and sped through to after the event. The only sexual content in the game that I'd say does have consistent and interesting value are the times when the game doesn't draw much attention to it and simply treats it as a thing that exists, rather than something you're intended to be turned on by, like with certain moments in Samamo and Kana's flashbacks. <sighs> Regardless of all the flaws I've brought up so far and my apprehension to actually call this game good, it is still a game with a lot going on that's as worthy of discussion as all the rough bits, and good god do I have a lot to say about the discussions and invites. Samamo, Natane, and Kana are all genuinely fascinating characters. Each of them have a complicated past of sorts, and each of them work through it in completely different yet intriguing ways, all handled with the level of respect that you might not necessarily expect to see in a game that looks like this half of the time. Samamo is perhaps the most normal character in the entire story, and Takuji's stepsister in purely legal terms only. While Takuji despises himself for being a siscon, which leads to some very bizarre fantasies and thoughts about her, Samamo doesn't seem too concerned with how their legal statuses may affect their relationship. Rather Rather, the complexity comes in with the contrast between how she sees herself and how other people see her. From the initial perspective of the player and of Takuji, she appears to be a stereotypical sweet loving little sister who just wants people to dote on her, giving a bright, chipper, almost carefree air. But underneath that surface is someone who suffered a lot of societal trauma and struggled any agency over herself in the world, and furthermore, doesn't see herself as worthy of that love. 
There are multiple points during the first and second act where she snaps for seemingly no discernible reason, getting frustrated at Takuji chasing after her when she runs off and almost gets hit by a car, snapping at Natane when she attempts to get everyone into the shelter, and it's not until the third act that we learn about her backstory before the remarriage that led to her and Takuji becoming acquainted. As a child, she was always the odd one out in school, being treated by other kids in a way that seemed kind on the surface, but was ultimately patronizing her for being weaker than the others. Nobody saw her as just a normal kid. So, when she was one day approached by a man looking for a paid date, she accepted it, talking for hours with a man who perhaps didn't have the cleanest view of her, but still saw her as her own person, something she didn't get anywhere else in her life. She continued to go on these dates, relishing in the sense of freedom it gave her, collecting money from them and using it to buy nice things for people, believing that she could get genuine friendship that way, but that too failed to lend her any true social life. During all of this, she continued to talk with her imaginary friend, a weaned cat named Dulce, who she vented to and got advice from. A friend that became increasingly more critical of her materialistic ways as she accrued more and more expensive name brand items, more wealth. In a desire to keep that wealth with its false sense of control flowing, she moved from paid dates to sex work, making far more than she did before, always telling herself the next client will be the last. But that last never comes because the end of her pursuit for material needs can never come. There is no goal in sight, nor mind, nor concrete reason. Her work went from a form of agency to a base want and need to fill emptiness. Of course, with this comes a sense of guilt, especially as she begins to develop feelings for Takuji. She feels that she, as a sex worker, isn't somebody that can be loved. She's too unfaithful for that. Yet she also can't abandon her pursuit of money, something intrinsically tied to the things that's given her agency. She can't decide for herself whether money or love for Takuji means more to her. She claims they're separate, but as her winged friend asks, are they? And so she wants to be hated. She doesn't want people to see something cute and lovely in her she wants people to despise her like she despises herself. It's something that Takuji can't do because, as he says, she hasn't done a thing to deserve it. And so they end the night talking with each other and joking like normal until the night comes to take them. I started out with what I think is the strongest character of the strongest moments, because she represents Shisatsu 101 at its absolute peak. While all of this craziness about Dempa waves, aliens, reality, and surreality is cool, the work is at its most interesting when it settles down and ties it all back to something grounded in reality. In this case, how depression and a lack of agency can lead people down dark paths. As much as I think narratives like Kaori's Root and Dokusei are a necessity, ones that portray sex work as something you can willingly choose to do and enjoy, it's also important to represent another side of it that's equally as real. A story like Samamo's show that a desire for agency and people struggling with life can be quickly turned into something depressing and further isolating, without chastising the worker or the act itself as something inherently problematic. It's a fine line to walk, and it's one I think the game walks particularly well with how it ties Samamo's impetus for entering her first step into the world of transactional relationships, paid dating, and with the struggles and social casts. While she may live what seems to be a stable life financially, that doesn't compensate for her emotional struggles, an apparently troubled relationship between her parents, and a frail body that leaves her friendless and unable to make actual bonds, being either bullied or treated differently. She is, by no fault of her own, seen as a lower person than other people, and thus a target. The struggles with this come up with other characters, but I think with Samamo it's particularly poignant to me as it's portrayed in such a earnest and realistic way that it hit close to home with many of my own experiences. As someone who's had much of their agency ripped away from them and been in those same miserable places of wanting to fit in and not be seen as special, every single choice that Samamo made felt like one that I probably would have done given the opportunity. Because that desire to be seen as just a person is a strong, innate one. It's one that led me to be close to people that exploited me, that led me to be in friend groups that had me repressing who I was. And if a man walked up to fragile, depressed 16-year-old me, desperate for attention, offering me money in exchange for talking for hours and being viewed as a person, I would have taken that attention, acknowledging but still overlooking the power and balance and objectification just as Samamo did. Her path in all of this shows a particularly rough but not unrealistic through line. A bad social life takes away all of her agency, and so she regains a semblance of it through paid dating. The money from that gives her a simulacrum of friendship, and so now money becomes a source of agency. Once it becomes clear that these monetarily driven social interactions are nothing, all that's left is a desire for more money to fill that hole, leading her to start sex work out of an emotional necessity with no fulfillment having been gained along this path. This doesn't make her a morally bad person, this doesn't make her a failed person, nor does it make the work she does any less valid a line of work. Rather, the failing lies of a complex web of social systems failing to give her any chance to create friendships because of her difference from the ideal, normal person with the perfect normal family. These struggles to fit in and the lengths one may go for agency are explored in a different way of Kana, the only other character who might be as obsessed with death, delusions, and boundaries as much as Takuji is, 
if not even more so with the first of her two Edo scenes involving self-harm to test the boundaries of life, to feel alive. A lot of what she does throughout the game and before the events of it is seemingly motivated by this morbid curiosity. Being someone who's obsessed with suicide, death, and desperation, knowing an incredible amount about famous incidents and experiments on things like learned helplessness. She even quizzes Takaji on these subjects twice in the game, once going as far as to break the fourth wall and ask the player to save the game before answering lest she kill herself if given the wrong answer. The method she chooses is one she seems to have found in the Kanzen Jisatsu Manyaru, or Complete Suicide Manual, a book which the game references once earlier and downright name drops later on. It has its own complex history and media controversies following its 1993 release, as it detailed various methods matter-of-factly, ranked by a number of criteria of little philosophy or reasoning, and with little judgment. It was influential for that reason, and equally grossly irresponsible for putting a dozen methods of print under the guise of being educational, without trying to challenge the reasons why someone might be picking up the book. The only question it presents that really sits at its core, and one that only exists to justify its existence, is a rhetorical, why must one live? I don't agree at all with how the book frames this as a valid counterpoint to why Japanese teens circa the mid-90s were taking their own lives, but viewed from a philosophical standpoint and not a suicidal one, nor the naive, misguided perspective of the book, it is an interesting one that feels like it exists at the core of Kana's character. Given her backstory and own failed lover's suicide that left her alive but took her first girlfriend, a woman named Yuki, a woman that made her tiring, dreadful life worth pushing through, it leaves her wondering, why does she have to live. To her, there doesn't seem to be anything left in the realm of the living, having lost the only thing that gave her a purpose while the father that abused Yuki still lives. But by the end of her story, she's taken the first steps towards finding a new answer by confiding in Takuji. Simply by talking, much of the burden of that question is lifted and she can look to utter brighter things than her past. And with it, the obsession with death comes lifted too. That last part is what I find to be most interesting about her. Her desire to push the boundaries of life and to understand a concept as unknowable as death reminded me a lot of the modern English version of the then contemporary Japanese internet death culture the game alludes to a select few times. There's enough people obsessed with watching others die to have a whole spectrum of subcultures around it, with some people who enjoy it as if watching a horror movie, others who have a morbid fascination of gore, and others who see some of the tales leading up to it as a more honest extension of the equally controversial and problematic true crime genre. While that seeks to glamorize terrible cases into something palatable and engaging for general audiences, gore and death videos and pictures are flatly horrifying. Regardless of the underlying personal interest, the content itself brings up many severe ethical and psychological problems. There has been multiple studies done showing that consuming this causes PTSD symptoms, sleep issues, severe anxiety, and the content itself can skirt legal boundaries and, in all cases, wouldn't exist if people people weren't killed or maimed in horrific ways. So what happens to the people who willingly expose themselves to hours of it daily, watching iceberg videos that abstract this content into sponsor-friendly words, made by people unaware of or not caring what people watch them and wander into readily accessible communities that provide them with a glut of the real thing? Some of those people grow out of it, but others become desensitized, traumatized, or radicalized into extremism with movements that exploit those interests, and that's something a lot of people simply don't address. Why I bring all this up here is because of how much it ties into Kana's character, as she's someone who seemingly fell into all this because of her own trauma. Sometime after the death of Yuki, she became utterly obsessed with reading as much as she possibly could on death, and when that didn't prove enough, she moved into what was present online, falling further into communities that encouraged her. Images of people being burned alive, eyes out of where they should be, animals gruesomely killed, and eventually began committing violent acts, harming herself, seemingly all for that sense of agency over an unstoppable force. She spins these self-harm habits as making her into someone educated on death and authority, but for as much as she postures, she nor anyone else can truly understand it, no matter how many horrible things they consume. It's a completely false sense of agency, one that presumably made her trauma and state of mind progressively worse. But it was all right there for her to consume. A book that walks you through every step of every method, that irresponsibly poses a question she nor most people picking it up are equipped to answer when they do, a stream of text piled on pictures, piled on videos that expose the finest details of things the mind is barely able to cope with once in a blue moon, and people who happily provide it without a care of the harm they caused. 
I don't think Kana truly enjoys being close to death, and I don't think she enjoys being brutalized during sex nor laying on a mountain of corpses. I think she, like the rest of the cast, is struggling with her past and wants to find any way she can to cope with it and maintain some control. To her, one of those methods is to chase death itself, pushing both her body and her mind to their limits, without ever seeming to accept that no amount of knowledge will ever undo what happened. It's merely self-harm. Natane, as well, is someone who struggles to reconcile with her history, but chooses a distinctly different route from either Samamo or Kana. While Samamo sought agency in selling her body and personality, and Kana seeks control by indulging unhealthily in what tore her from her love, Natane copes with her own past by constructing an entire world around it and pleading others to believe in her delusions. She's made entire pseudoscientific pamphlets about the workings of aliens, has elaborate theories and explanations for everything, and responds to criticism and disbelief of either a collected tone ready to dissuade all of it, or fits of rage at people who don't see what she does, even if what she sees is ultimately just a way for her to cope with abuse as a child. It's a contentious topic to try and tackle, but it's one that I was genuinely surprised by how respectfully and realistically it was portrayed. She was sexually abused as a child not by some random stranger, but by her seemingly kind and loving stepfather, only putting together what was happening after finding sexually exploitive material in his study. What she thought were dreams of being assaulted by aliens were her stepfather dressed in a childish alien costume, leading her to blame everything on the greys and construct an entire fictitious, false reality based on this idea just to cope with it. While I am mixed on using she was traumatized to effectively say everything she claims about the aliens is dubious, thus muddying the waters as to whether or not the aliens actually exist, stripped away from the context of how it affects the story, it's a surprisingly mature and realistic way to handle sexual abuse trauma. Most abuse isn't committed by random people as the aliens seem to stand in for here. It's committed by people the victim knows, people they trust and care deeply about, and that makes talking about and acknowledging it all the harder as one fights their own conflicting feelings. Not that they chooses not to acknowledge it, and and instead find ways to cope with and rationalize it. In her case, it's to construct an entire fictive reality that pins what happened to her on something that's more abstract and easier to hate. The aliens she imagines can be, and are, beings of evil that want to destroy humanity, and that's much more dislikable than a man who puts on a kind mask, a man society likely would refuse to accept as a possible perpetrator by virtue of appearing kind. Not only is running away from all of her problems unhealthy, however, it alienates her from other people. Like how Samamo is seen as a target to either patronize or harass for her differences, Natane is viewed not as someone who may be struggling and needs people to listen to, a community to help her out of this, but as somebody to laugh at or exploit. Many people think she's insane and blow her off, and others use her fears and trauma against her to get what they want. Mido happily plays into both, simultaneously calling her a dempa bitch at multiple points while also going along with her to coerce sex out of her. The end result is someone who is pushed deeper and deeper into a hole, unable to get the help they need, stuck in a society that chastises those who fall at the norm and refuse to assist them, all while battling trauma that she's unable to and doesn't want to face, reinforced by her flashback being told entirely with third-person narration rather than by herself, like how Kana or Samamos is. At the very least, she is granted a potential happy future. One of those worlds that Takuji creates is one where she decides she's ready to try and move on, showing that one doesn't have to live like this forever. These three characters are all endlessly fascinating to me because they represent different forms of trauma, isolation, grief, and abuse, and radically different ways of coping with each, all commentating on societal matters that to this day feel relevant and important, perhaps even more so than before. To summarize everything I've said up to this point, as enjoyable as it can be to theorycraft, as fun as the wild sci-fi shenanigans of Takuji's world can be, Jisatsu is truly at its strongest when it's dealing with these complex themes and when the story is being, for lack of a better term, normal, that I feel it hits the strongest and leaves the greatest impressions. And what I hope I've illustrated at this point is that some of Jisatsu's characters are legitimately fascinating and many are full of depth, tackling topics that few other stories want to and even fewer can do so with the level of respect and care presented here in its most shining moments. My descriptions can't do full justice to what it's like to see these come together with the larger package. However, that larger package is also one that's massively flawed. Half of the characters are either cardboard or do utterly nothing, the Edo scenes can be offensively bad, part of the game are a slog to read, and there's this feeling that what you're reading could have been so much greater had it not been a bunch of disparate parts pieced together. And I get why all these things might lead some watching this video to decide against playing the game because, well, those are huge and understandably difficult to deal with problems. At the very least in its heyday, the title did garner enough patient and curious fans for Duke to proceed on with planning a sequel named Maki Shoujo Byo, which got as far as having the entire script finished in 2003, but went down along with the brand. It did briefly 
resurface in the early 2010s, but that's a whole other complex story that's best explained by a blog post by a user named Amayada, which I'll be linking in the description. Because of Duke's untimely closure, Jisatsu received a pretty low print run with no reprints afterwards, with demand only skyrocketing recently thanks to the likes of Subahibi and Chaos Child causing resurgence of interest in old Denpa games. As a result, getting your hands on a legitimate copy of this game might be a bit of a challenge- OH GOD WHAT'S HAPPENING IN THERE! Yeah, obtaining this game without resorting to downloading a copy off the internet is impossible, and it doesn't look like that's gonna change anytime soon. It's a shame too, as this makes this the only one of the free big Denpa games that's nigh impossible to get. Asayo Oshi is available as a shockingly cheap digital download, and Sui no Soda is included in the Subihibi 10th Anniversary box, which is rather expensive at 2800 yen, but you genuinely get an impressive amount of content with that. I think most people are familiar with this game now only through prestige and references to it that have become memes and bits unto themselves. Asuba Hibi pays a lot of tribute to this game in many ways including joking about the sequel, and everyone's favorite Edoge VTuber Bunny Himari did a whole video about a fan lending her the game and begging for it to get an actual re-release. You know what? That's an admirable goal. At the end of it all, is it worth tracking down Jisatsu 101 and setting aside the time to read it? Maybe. On one hand, I think it's a title with some genuinely incredible moments that I won't be forgetting anytime soon, and it has an atmosphere that's unlike any other game I've played or likely will ever play. On the other, you can absolutely tell this game needed more time in the oven in every way from the story structure to the unresolved threads, the woefully short soundtrack, the weird tonal whiplashes, and the very, very scrunculated art. In no way do I regret checking this game out or taking the time to create a video on it because I think there's a lot here that people might be able to get something out of. In the same way someone might be moved by a series like Lane or Eva without fully understanding what's happening, Jisatsu's strengths are so powerful that I believe you really can get something out of it on an unexplainable emotional level, even if the literal text can be difficult to get a grasp on. If anything I've said has intrigued you and you aren't dissuaded by the faults and some of the more extreme content, then I think it's worth reading through this game and making what you can out of it. It's not an all-time classic, and it's not a must-play to be caught up on visual novel history and lore, but it is a title with a lot of soul. And if you want something that's weird as hell, then this game will absolutely deliver.